It's time to accelerate. Hey friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 656, 656 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. I have two great conversations lined up for you today. First up will be Pat Lynch. Many of you know Pat from his years of work as one of the principals at CSO Insights, the B2B sales research firm. And Pat's now the Vice President of Sales Enablement Excellence and Innovation at MindTickle. And following Pat, I have another fun talk with my fellow co-conspirator, Bridget Gleason. Today's show is brought to you in part by our friends at Discover.org. The Discover.org platform is a game changer for sales and marketing professionals. The feature-rich sales intelligence platform is supported by over 250 researchers who are continually updating contact data and providing account-specific insight to help sales and marketing teams break ahead of the pack. So see the product live at discover.org.com forward slash schedule hyphen demo. That's discover.org.com forward slash schedule hyphen demo. Okay, first up on Accelerate this week is Pat Lynch. And today we're talking about sales enablement. Actually, this is the first of two conversations I'm having with Pat on this topic of sales readiness and sales enablement. The next one you'll see not coming up in a few weeks here on the show. You know, sales enablement is perhaps the fastest growing area in sales, and it plays an increasingly important role in helping make sales teams ready to sell and also enabling them to become more relevant to their buyers. Now, this is a critical issue for sales professionals. Uh, studies find that more and more C-level execs are reporting that they're not really getting value from the interaction with sales reps. And that's obviously a problem for sellers as we need to be able to have those high-level conversations in order to win deals. So in our conversation today, Pat shares his perspectives and shares some case studies on the role of sales enablement in helping sellers win more deals. All right, here we go. Pat Lynch, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Andy. Greetings from San Francisco. Oh, you are in San Francisco today. Great. Yeah. From Denver, but in San Francisco. In today. San Francisco. Okay. So, um, standard question I, I ask all my guests when they come on. The first question is so, in your mind, what's, what's the single biggest challenge facing sales reps today? I would say that the biggest challenge facing sales reps today is the lack of effective and good coaching they're receiving. Okay. I, I would agree in, in large measure with that. <laughs> so is that different? I mean, I think back to early in my career, and you can look back early in your career in sales. I, I have all these memories of lots of good coaching. Uh, in fact, you know, mentors I can specifically point to that were you know, largely responsible for helping me develop as the way I developed. I mean, this, what's changed? Well, um, the, you are very fortunate. Andy, very fortunate. Um, you know, the research I, I, from several different resources, I think talks around 25 to 36 minutes a week uh, that a sales manager is providing coaching. Mm. Uh, not sure what that means. And it doesn't say good coaching to a rep. And I'm, I'm always fascinated by that because um, if you've ever played a, a sport, a team sport, mm. you just, I mean, other than flag football, maybe growing up as a kid or something, uh, in, uh, let's just take high school, right? It's not like five guys just showed up uh, some Friday night to play another team. Right. They, they were coached and they ran plays. So what I find fascinating is let's fast forward to real life. Got to make a paycheck, uh, a profession. Mm -hmm. And it's like um, people are showing up Friday night and, you know, pick a ball, but they're responsible to to actually win, hit a number. Right. There, there's almost very, very little coaching going on. So um, well, I, I call I call it a plague in the sales profession today. Well, I agree. And I, I so I was at a Topo Summit a couple of years ago, and there was a panelist who shall remain nameless, who said somewhat disparagingly, eh, "We don't do one on ones anymore. They're a waste of time." <laughs> okay. It was a VP, a VP from a SaaS company. Okay. And I, I, was, I saw the same reaction you did. It was just sort of stunned silence. It's like, okay. <laughs> it's like, and I can understand that if, if they're one-on-ones, and it sounded like from what he's talking about, he treated his one-on-ones as basically a deal review. And, and, and it's, it's gotten so bad in some conversations when I talk to VPs, again, especially from tech companies, but you're seeing it in others now too, is, is to say, well, maybe we need to redefine everything. And say, look, we've got managing. Coaching 
we'll say, yeah, that's just tactical, right? And then we have mentoring, which is developing the individual. And maybe we need to change our paradigm. So instead of we think about coaching and the people not really knowing what it is, we get more specific and say, okay, we've got managing. You know, you're organizing, directing activities. You've got coaching, which is, hey, we're going to talk about this deal and what you need to do to get it closed. And then we're going to talk about mentoring is let's talk about, hey, what, what do you think you need to do to get better and how can I help you? Right. Yeah, uh, the reason I, I, I believe strongly that it's a plague that's um, affecting our profession um, is because, le- you know, let's just look at the data and research for a moment, mm-hmm. okay? Um, like my wife says, you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. Um, right. And so it helps to bring some objectivity. And so if we just look at, uh, I'm a big believer in Stephen Covey's Seven Habits mm-hmm. Um, of highly successful people begin with the end in mind. Right. So if you're in sales, your end in mind is to win, <laughs> to close the deal, right? And then you work backwards. What I'm stunned by, and I'm and I'm not being sensational with these adjectives, is if again back to CSO mm-hmm. Insights which you mentioned earlier in the program, I would say one of the most powerful and compelling data points I've ever seen in research of all the different research is the fact that if you move, uh, and this is according to CSO Insights, move from an ad hoc uh, sales coaching program to a formal sales coaching program, you can get a lift in win rates already in your forecast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, you know, around 11 to 13% increase right. in win rates. Right. So I remember, uh, asking sales leaders, um, and I still do today, if you're not focused on some type of formal sales coaching process, knowing that the upside is so huge, what are you doing? And then work backwards. Yeah. So, Well, I, I, I sort of phrase it the same way. I put out an article in the video a couple of years ago. I was basically saying, if you're not coaching, what the hell are you doing? Oh, amen, brother. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, you're, you're only going to succeed if the people that work for you succeed. So if that's not your top priority every day, right? what is? Well, yeah. And so um, let's rewind that a little bit. Sure. So I was at a banking conference, and it, there was one sales program in the banking mm-hmm. conference. Okay, And I was one of a handful of non-bankers. And I went to the sales um aspect of it. And there was probably about 50 people in attendance. And I was at a table with about um, 11 people. I heard so much stuff about what coaching wasn't. I finally just, you know, raised my hand. I said, could you all define what coaching is to me? Now, I'm I'm not making this up. Out of the 11 people, eight said, coaching is when my rep comes into my office and reports to me what they're doing for the day. And I said, well, that's like Peyton Manning going to the sideline and telling the coach what he's about to do and then coming back in. I'm like, no. Right. But so I think sometimes we have to literally um, reset. Right. And go, do you you actually know what coaching is? And and by the way, I'm not throwing sales managers or sales leaders under the bus. The reason I believe strongly that it's a plague that affects our profession is because there are very few mentors. Um, how do you, how do you, how can you do better if you've never seen better, better right. right? If you've never been coached, if you've never even seen a coach, let alone good coaching, how can we expect realistically that um, a top performing sales rep who's been promoted into a sales manager could even be successful? I mean, I've, I've got some comment on that. I can, I can reserve till later, but I think it, I think we need to agree as a profession that um, we're being afflicted. I, so. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that it's, it's you know, part of this trend we're seeing with, um, yeah, I don't, sort of lazy term, I'll say big data, is and metrics is that somehow we can become sort of metrics jockeys, the, the term that some people use, not me. But we mm. turn sales managers into people who are just looking at the metrics and a, not really understanding how to use that data, but then thinking they can use it to, quote unquote, coach people. And, and unfortunately, it's, it's not working. I mean, this is, to me, one of the plagues we have of, uh, in sales is we're generating more data than we know what to do with, and we don't know how to use it. And what we d- tend to do with the data is we tend to use it as human beings do, not just salespeople, is sort of to confirm what we already believe to be true. 
and right. rather than questioning any assumptions that we really have. And so that also, I think, is sort of the thing. It's a sort of easy reliance. And you see this sort of times, especially, I think, in SaaS companies. You know, I hear this all the time is, is you know, if they're sending out a 1,000 emails and hoping to, at the end of the day, to convert, you know, 20 of those into orders, if they have to double sales the next year, the first thing I think about is let's double the number of emails we send as opposed to saying, well, how do we make each of our contacts more effective and efficient so that we can increase our close rate out of 1,000 as opposed to, you know, slash and burn a bigger number. And this yeah, is... And I, yeah, and I notice when you describe that, uh, where is the human person in that? Where's the mm-hmm. behavioral aspect, right? Right. I mean, there's machine learning. Well, that implies who's learning? The machine? The person? I mean, what's... Sometimes we just remember, right? I began with a research company sure. that has an ecosystem, but there's no customer involved. I'm like, okay, <laughs> something's wrong with that picture. And I think that's actually a, a little bit scary when we start building ecosystems and they don't have a customer. And this is a sales enablement ecosystem. Right. Yeah. So, I, I, so well, let's, let's dive into sales enablement because this begins to address the issue. And, and, yeah, I think there's confusion about what sales enablement means. And mm-hmm. I think the the picture maybe is more expansive than a lot of people understand. I mean, a lot mm-hmm. of times you talk to people, sales enablement is just, uh, hey, let's get the right content at the right time for the sales rep. Um, all right, that's fine. But yeah, I tend to look at it more as you do, I think, from a behavioral standpoint, is how do we, in a sales readiness standpoint, is how do we get our people in a position where they can deal effectively with a prospect? Right. Now, I, I, I know the difference between correlation and causation, but you're I find one, you're it, one of the few, by the way. Well, I, I, only because I, you know, I try to memorize the definition just, you know, so I don't get confused. Um, but what is interesting, and I'm, I'm not going to correlate the data here, but we talked earlier about this slippery slope of overall quota attainment mm-hmm. um, by CSO Insights, one of the most powerfully scary Um, research pieces a sales leader would ever see. And that's going, you know, I think it was 2011 to 2016, overall quota team went from 63% down to 51%, right? This is based on their survey of what, 2,500? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure of the sample size, but yeah, it was was a large sample size. But the bottom line is, as you know, you can actually develop a trend, right, over five, six-year period, and it's going in the wrong direction, right? right? Actually, a very scary direction. Isn't it interesting to see that the title of sales enablement within the last three years has just skyrocketed? Mm -hmm. Um, I I think the latest stat was, I don't know, higher than 25%. In the last year, the number of titles was sales enablement on LinkedIn, so maybe what's taking place in the marketplace is management is realizing rut row. It's going the wrong way. We all know what the definition of insanity is. Hey, let's grab that person mm. who's in sales training or maybe sales ops. Stop, you know, stop the bleeding. Right. Right. So I'm not sure, but, uh, and I'm not going to correlate that data, but it's interesting to see. Right. So the question is what's taking place here? Why? Did the Sales Enablement Society, which just started two years ago, go from, uh, of which I'm a founding member out of Denver, uh, why did we go from zero to 2,500 members as a all-volunteer organization in less than two years? Something's up. So, I agree. So, yeah, it, uh, interesting to see what the lead time is uh, in terms of starting to see a turnaround. But, but so tell people, you know, in your mind, what, what is sales enablement? Well, it's a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, uh, So I I don't know if Scott Santucci is the actual author of this quote, but I I heard it first at the the National Sales Enablement Society meeting in Dallas last year. And um, he said that a sales enablement has been defined as um, the person who is the fixer of broken things. So um, that oftentimes is what's happening. Um, For me, I, I... Again, I take a very, very different viewpoint only in that sales enablement should be focused on helping our salespeople win. Can we just get down to that definition, to that simple definition? 
because before the title sales enablement, you had sales support. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there've been people like myself in the past and others who are doing sales support. And then over time, it started to mature into sales enablement. But there's a lot of things that sales enablement people can do for salespeople, for sales managers, for sales leaders. But at the end of the day, if they're not helping their salespeople win, kind of back to what you said earlier, if they're not helping, the sales managers not helping to coach their people to win, what are they doing? Well, right? I think, so I think that's a question so, that, that many managers will sort of come up with or CEOs listening to this conversation saying, well, okay, if your job is to help sales win, isn't that my VP of sales job? Well, okay, let me give you an example. So I was, um, so I was involved in working with a Fortune 500 company um, with their sales architecture, okay? And um, really smart people, they're doing a fabulous job. Uh, what was interesting is um, HR got involved on a global scale. Hmm. Now, what was very interesting in that time frame of probably two, three months, I was listening for, as the architecture was being built in sales enablement, how are you going to help your salespeople win? It never came up. It, it never came up. It was about training the salespeople, uh, rarely coaching, but, but a lot of training and, and content and sales process. I mean, really important things, very good things. But how come if you're designing this infrastructure, you don't begin with the end in mind? Right. I, I'm just asking the question. And they said. <laughs> exactly. They said, right. Well, I think, that, I think that is one of the dangers, I think, on one hand, with, with um, I think we've seen a little bit, with sort of the increased specialization within sales. And I believe me, I, I think sales enablement, is a very important function because clearly something's not not occurring that should be occurring in terms of helping our people putting our people in position to win. Um, but yeah, I think people get it's part of the I think the after effect of the or one of the effects of this hyper specialization of roles is that people are just so focused on just what they do and in a very sort of micro sense and we don't tie the whole piece together that no, starts we, with we, the customer and correct and I, I make. I make the same comment because I've, you know, this this podcast, you know, I've done well over 650 episodes and I've probably interviewed 150 to 200, you know, SaaS company founders or, or uh, uh, you know, VPs or something. And, you know, the one question they have struggled to answer is, well, okay, how does your, they talk about the process and so on. So it's great. You got your process and your support of these tools, but how does this help the customer make a decision? To buy from you, yeah, uh, that is a great point, right? So, again, I'm 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 not being sensational, but it's a little scary when a research firm puts a, a sales enablement ecosystem together and leaves out the customer, mm-hmm. right? So, um, <laughs> uh, anytime you build the sales process, if you have one, by the way, right? A lot of companies have sales methodologies, but right. the hard work is building that foundation. Uh, you know, if you can begin to build the foundation of sales process, the next step, okay, before the framing of the home mm-hmm. goes in, you've got the concrete foundation, can we please agree that there's a customer out there and that we might want to think about mapping our sales process to their buying process? We just might want to think about that. Um, I've, I've worked with a lot of companies who do, in fact, have a sales process and they have these really nice sales stages and sales playbooks. And the scary thing, I probably need to come up with a better word, Andy. <laughs> You've only used it about five times, but yeah. We... Yeah, um, uh, is the fact that there is no uh, customer buying process. Well, I think so that's not, one of the challenges, I think, for sales enablement is that, see, I think, I think the customer buying process, for the most part, is a fiction. In that the sense that, you know, you look at most products that, that we're selling these days, especially for you know, selling a complex product of any sort, you know, the customer you know, buys this once every five years. They don't have a documented process for something they do once every five years. And so, so I think when we talk about 
just a point you made before is we get so rigid with our processes, our stages, our stage exit criteria, da 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 da, because we're trying to map it to something that occurs once every five years. And and so it, I think to me one of the the things about getting people sales ready is is sort of this not just training, not just situational training. You know, I sort of use three three R's. You know, uh, readiness, relevance and risk is we have to be able to teach people how to be adaptable and take risks in order to move deals forward, right? That aren't within the narrow constraints of the process you've laid out. To me, the top performers in life that I've always worked with and I've seen myself and I've done myself is, is yeah, I think I have an idea of what I think the buyer's process is, but I know it's not necessarily going to conform to that. So what do I do when reality hits, hits my process? And that's where the rubber meets the road in many cases is salespeople don't know how to adapt because we're training them that you've got this rigid set of stages and these exit criteria and playbooks. It's like, well, that's great. I love that. But life doesn't conform to that. So what do you do at that point? Yeah, so um, I'll tell you a little story on that. Okay. All right. So Once upon a time, I was working for a large company. And... um, the vice president of sales said, um, we're going to be nimble. <laughs> and I thought, nope, uh, we're a really big company. We can never be nimble. Uh, I think I was the only um, person hired from outside the company um, out of the 130 division managers. And so I said, um, uh, we'll never be nimble. Well, I think his face started to get kind of red. Yeah. Um, And I thought, okay, the next thing out of my mouth better be good because it'll save my job, I hope. (laughs) And so um, I I asked everybody, I said, has anybody been on an aircraft carrier? And fortunately, nobody had been on an aircraft carrier. And I said, okay, uh, will an aircraft carrier ever be nimble? Well, no. Okay. We're never going to be nimble. However, What's on an aircraft carrier that's nimble? An F-18 mm. fighter. I said, our job at this very big company is to go find those F-18s, of which I did. I found um, the whole um, master black belt division within this company, and, and, and we are catapulted off the deck. Mm. Uh, today, companies say they want to be nimble. The radical change that's happening, Andy, is companies. These large companies with technology can actually start to be that F-18. And that is something uh, dramatic. Mm -hmm. Now, I've only seen that from leaders who have a real vision and they're not afraid of taking risk, but they also have an experience of using technology uh, and a platform like a sales readiness platform. You know, maybe that's our carrier deck, right? Right. Right. We catapult off, you know, the, our clients. Mm-hmm. Um, but we literally, we allow them to be nimble. Um, I've called myself Gumby for many years uh, in sales. You know, Gumby bends, but Gumby doesn't break. Right, right. And um, so go back to the definition of sales enablement, the fixer of broken things. Well, if you're Gumby, if you're nimble as a sales enablement practitioner, chances are you're going to be very successful. I, I think it's probably a... a- a key requirement for anybody that's in that that job is that you have to be flexible because, yeah, as I mentioned before, it's just one of the things I always find so curious is, and maybe it's just a sign of of you know when I developed my own sales career, we didn't have these technologies, but you know if I spent fifteen years selling complex multi million dollar communication systems for startups to the major mm. corporations of the world, and so we had no track record, no branding. You know, no, no technology. You know, I'd, I'd fly to Europe to cold call. I mean, it's that type of thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> but in first class too. No, no. no. <laughs> Believe okay. me. Okay. I wish. Not not in those not in the early days of those companies. Um, but you know, you just you had real world to deal with, right? As you just had to do what needed to be done. And, and I, I'm concerned. You talk things that are scary. What I see as scary is is that. Again, we we seem to be. It's sort of interesting, especially so a lot of this, a lot of the leading edge stuff emanates out of our tech tech you know segments in terms of sales, use of technology, 
and it's now starting to proliferate outside of that. But I find it one of really sort of interesting that in industries that are companies are devoted to disrupting the markets they're going into are adopting increasingly rigid sales processes. And, and we're not preparing people to be adaptable and to take the risks they need to take in the moment in order to move deals forward. And I think, right. that, I think that's part of what accounts for what I consider a really abysmally low close rate, like in the SaaS business in general. You know, 20% mm-hmm. close rate, and they pat themselves on the back. And I'm thinking back when I was selling 20%, I was out of work. Correct. So right. they make it up by numbers, though. This is where we get to the volume and the quality, quantity versus quality right. dilemma. Because some companies, if they're especially sort of the lucky ones that have really identified the product market fit and they're riding the wave, mm-hmm. that number quantity business works for a while. All right, it covers a lot of sins. Eventually, right, right. eventually you pay the piper. Right. So you can uh, carpet bomb people with email um, or you could be strategic. You could have a, a drip campaign that actually is dripping value. I mean, real mm-hmm. value. Right. Uh, why don't more companies do that? It takes time. And especially if you're a SaaS company, um, you know, the clock is always ticking. Uh, tick tock, tick tock. But again, I'm, I'm just, I believe um, my responsibility is to oftentimes help not only here at Mind Tickle, but in the marketplace. Let's just pause between the stimulus and the response. Let's just pause for a moment. And so the reason I, I, I say let's pause, I'm speaking out of the eye, is because the very first class I ever took, training course in sales, I'll never forget it. Um, the instructor said, I, I want to give you an equation. I'm thinking, okay, this is sales. I'm not real good at math. Um, he said, no. He, he goes, you'll use this. Trust plus empathy equals relationship. And I can, I can tell you that over the, when I learned that 24 years ago, I've used that equation more in the last two years than in the 22 years before that. Question is why? Because as we move rapidly using technology, the human starts to get left behind little by little by little to the point where we're not even putting customers in a sales enablement ecosystem. Um, or we're, we're mapping a sales process and we spent a lot of money on this and we've got some great playbooks, but we have no idea how our customer buys. Clearly, maybe we need to pause between all this stimulus, right? And our rapid response. So if I can help just bring a little bit of sanity and, and also a genuine voice of the customer, as in we have a customer <laughs> or, or we have a prospect, let's not forget them, right? In all the rah-rah, then, then maybe we can be more successful. You know, there's a Mike Easterday. He's the CEO of Integrity Solutions. When I first met him, um, he said, well, you know, Pat, sales is a noble profession. I've never heard that before. I've never heard that since. And I loved that statement by Mike. And I'm like, you know what? Sales not can be a noble profession. Sales is a noble profession. And so again, begin with the end in mind. If you can start with sales as a noble profession, then look back and go, is everything we're doing, are we making it? a truly noble profession. Well, I think that the the key to making it a noble profession is the customer experience during their buying process. And yeah, we certainly, consumer products, a lot of emphasis talked about, you know, customer experience in the buying process, you know, through the online purchase, not nearly enough in B2B sales. Do we talk about the customer experience Throughout the buying process, yeah, we'll talk about it in customer success and and so on. But this is, to my mind and my experience, and this is, yeah, I don't think is, is you know, an outlandish thing to say. Is, is people don't give enough credence to the percentage of the customer decision that's based on their experience going through the buying process with you. Right. So let's let's take a look at that and, and ask ourselves why is that happening? Right. Who who's kind of at fault there? All right. So um, I'll take some of the blame. OK, um, in that, for example, um, how are we training? You know, it's kind of like, what are we teaching our kids in school? Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but what are what 
not not how we're training for a moment, but what are we teaching our sellers? What mm -hmm. are we? How are we teaching them? But what are we teaching them? Right. Okay. So I'll give you a concrete example. Um, I, I've worked with some just fantastic companies, um, large companies, smaller companies, but Xerox. I went to Xerox University mm -hmm. in Leesburg uh, for two and a half months. You go through incredible right. training. FedEx, incredibly well run company. Um, in each of these companies, they had what's known as learning management systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. They were, they were telling me how they wanted me to be taught. And this was the methodology. Uh, okay. I buy that. Uh, I'm on your field, right? You're the coach. I'm the player. Uh, you own this field. This is how you run the play. What was really uh, interesting about that is that I learned but I quickly forgot a lot of that information and I would have to go back to the LMS to remember something right. or, you know, how to do something. Uh, that's not helping me sell. That's not helping my team sell. And so let's go back to that team sport, right? When you're actually playing the sport, do you just like stop in midfield and go, Oh, I got to go to the LMS. <laughs> oh, Oh, I got it. Okay. Freeze time. Okay. Everybody let's, Proceed Coach, with the play. What am I supposed to be doing? Right. Exactly. And but that's what we're asking our sellers to do day in and day out with and and, and no offense to an LMS. Okay. I, I I call them if if you're looking at an LMS for salespeople, I call that a legacy management system. Right. Okay. It it's not helped me make one dime. And I don't know that it's helping sellers who are on the field playing the game right now. I don't know that it's helping them make any money. So the radical, I know paradigm shift is a bit overused, but the radical change because of technology, okay, is a platform in which the seller can learn as they're selling. Mm -hmm. That is a dramatic shift. Um, that's why one of the reasons why I joined MindTickle uh, is because literally we're part of the cure. Right. I, I vetted, like you mentioned, you know, many, many SaaS companies. I've seen a lot of what works and what doesn't. And um, if I really do believe, which I do, that there's a plague, one plague in the sales profession of the lack of effective sales coaching, why would I want to spend any of my professional career um, being part of that ailment? Yeah. Absolutely not. And so that's why I'm where I am today mm -hmm. is we are part of the cure. And then um, I really want to make sure that the profession of sales enablement, and now we're starting to really be pulled into um, learning management and, and, and more and more I'm, I'm listening right. and learning from chief learning officers. Why? Because there's a lot of pain out there and people need a cure. They really genuinely need a solution. Technology can absolutely help them, but not the noise of, I think Nancy Narden has close to 450 sales tools. I mean, well, there, there are a couple thousand, I think all told now. Well, yeah, maybe. Okay. Thank you for correcting me, but I, I don't think that's helping our, our sales profession. No. And I'm not saying that just because it's my opinion. I'm literally saying that because many of my peers in sales enablement, when I was at CSO insights, and since I've been at mind tickle have come to me saying, Pat, uh, I don't have, I know technology is passing me by which sales tools should I get? Right. So I, look, I know we're talking about SaaS and we're in, we're in high tech, but but also there's a, a lot of industries out there that um, are not as mature. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll give you an example. I, I made a posting on LinkedIn. I was talking to a sales enablement professional outside high tech. And I said, tell me about your sales stack. And he said, what's a sales stack? Mm -hmm. And I thought, OK, good point, you know. Uh, bad on me. So I think sometimes we always need to be understanding first, right? Rather than, hey, I want you to, uh, I want you to see it my way. And even though I'm with a, a, a fantastic SaaS company, I'm in the sales enablement society. There's a lot of high tech. That doesn't mean that that translates to yeah. other verticals. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Well, I think one of the the new perspectives, at least from my from my perspective, <laughs> not being too redundant, is that the sales profession needs to adopt 
is, I mean, I love this idea of sales readiness. I mean, I think that this puts a stake in the ground for uh, starting to measure proficiency in a way that that's really important, right? And rather than just sort of, hey, bring everybody in for a, a day and we're going to, you know, bring in Andy Paul and he's going to talk to him. And then, you know, I disappear. And as you said, three days later, everybody's forgotten that is that you have a sort of ongoing way to measure people's readiness to sell to the customers that you're serving. And we'll sort of call that proficiency. But I think the other thing you brought up earlier, which is to me is extremely important that not enough attention is given to is this concept I call relevance. You know, I think that if people, salespeople thought about, am I relevant to my buyers? That it puts a whole different spin on it for them to say, okay, we've got all this technological change we referenced before, AI, machine learning, you know, that's, that's changing the equation on both selling and buying side is how do I maintain my relevance to the customer? And, and I think that really, to me, it becomes the distinguishing characteristic between those who get the business and those who don't is you're demonstrating your relevance. And, you know, that obviously has lots of components to it, you know, business acumen, experience, proficiency in certain ways, relationship building, being a human, as you prefaced our conversation with to start with how valuable that is. I think it's becoming more valuable. Um, I, I think that's just something we need to spend more time focusing on. And and it's it's harder to measure. I've been thinking about how we actually measure relevance. But but I think but I think but part of it is a mindset too is saying look I'm, I'm going to put some of the onus on you as an individual as a salesperson yeah, we can do so much for you and we need to do more obviously but also there's a part that only the, the individual need will be able to come up with too that says what am, what are my customers really looking for from me well I'm not going to disagree with you Andy okay on the relevance part but let's go back for a moment on. What about a sales manager or sales leader saying, um, you need to be relevant and I'm going to help you be more relevant, well, right? That'd be, That's, that'd be fantastic. Well, it would be, but you know, the question is, why is not that happening? Uh, don't know the answer. So I think we, we need to put the onus on the salesperson. Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a noble profession. They've chosen that profession, but let's, let's not leave out the sales manager or sales leader. So um, well, I, I think, and I'll, I, I'll give you, I'll give an answer of that before we go because okay, we have please. to wrap up yeah. in a second. But yeah, I'll, I'll give you a few, a few words. I mean, Xerox, IBM. You know, I started Burroughs. These were companies that trained. You know, we had an ecosystem of yes. companies, especially in the tech, leading edge tech companies, leading edge at the time. That, as you said, you spent two and a half months at at uh, you know in Leesburg we had Xerox University. I spent I don't know ten or twelve weeks, my first year and a half at, with Burroughs and training. I mean, mm -hmm. think about that. What tech company do we know that within the first year and a half, <laughs> people are spending 10 to 12 weeks off-site yeah. learning their job and their profession? Yeah. And yeah. it wasn't perfect training by any stretch of imagination, but it was this basis. And, and what's, what we don't have now, and I think this is what is one of the complicating issues, is we have to learn how to compensate for the lack of this these mm -hmm. days. Because even our big tech companies, at least to my knowledge, aren't requiring people to spend that much time learning their jobs. Right. So getting, so back to sales readiness for mm -hmm. a moment, right? I, I, I'm glad you brought up the salesperson needs to be relevant. Um, if you're not relevant, uh, are you sales ready? So just a, sure. a quick story on that. Uh, so I was calling on a hospital, a very large hospital. And this is the time when pharma reps could just come and go in a right. hospital. So I'm, um, we closed this hospital and then a healthcare system and um, the economic buyer um, went to a regional sales conference and he was the keynote. So I had him in the car. So I asked him one question. I said, um, why, why did, why did you take my call? You know, why did you do business with me, you know, with us? Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what? He goes, I've been thinking about that. Like, how did you get through? Because he told me that, I'm not kidding, he got 70 reps a day calling on him. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Exhausting, right? Well, yeah. And he said, you know, but when you called, which wasn't a lot, you gave me something of value. That, Yeah, that's what I remember. And I've never forgot that. And so going back to your point, Andy, on relevance, I think 
the goal of a sales readiness platform should make that salesperson through ongoing learning, whether that be uh, you know starting and onboarding. And by the way, don't leave them after you've mm-hmm. onboarded them, right? Don't desert them. You got them. Um, whether that be through gamification, micro learning, other types of training, analytics, you know, all of that, right? Help them really create and internalize that value, that relevancy, right. so that ongoing training constantly reinforces the value and the relevancy that you can bring to a customer or prospect. I don't care what you're selling. You're probably going to be very good at it and very successful. Excellent. All right, Pat, we're going to have to have you back pretty soon because we just didn't even touch what I had prepared to talk about today. (laughs) But it was a great conversation. It was a great conversation, though, and a lot of value for people. I hope it was uh, beneficial for others. I know you and I had a good time. No, I'm I'm sure it absolutely is. And that's why we just need to have you back on and continue it. So, um, yeah, well, so just tell people a little bit quickly about MindTickle before we go. And and, uh, I know we're going to do another session later on about MindTickle, too. So tell us a little bit about MindTickle. Yeah, so I would just say, um, which many people don't know, MindTickle was formed by four engineers from India who had never sold a thing in their life. I'm like, okay, uh, tell me more. And um, they saw a problem in sales and they said, let's go solve that. So I, I love the fact that MindTickle, and not many people know this, is actually an engineering company. We have many engineers at MindTickle, and we have our culture is actually based on there's a problem. Let's go solve it. Mm-hmm. I, I Right out of college, I worked in aerospace engineering. I love working with engineers because of that mentality. So everything we do at MindTickle with our platform, it's not a tool. Uh, you can probably take five tools, and that's our platform out of the box from a sales readiness mm-hmm. standpoint, whether that be onboarding training, gamification, micro learning uh, for SKOs, all bundled with analytics. Um, It's bringing that objectivity I talked about earlier, because when you're in the frame, you can't see the picture, right? right? So MindTickle really does bring a lot of objectivity for sales managers to actually begin the process of coaching with objective data, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, At MindTickle, that culture, that mindset of there's a problem we need to solve for it, doesn't just apply to prospects. Oh my gosh, once uh, you're a customer at MindTickle, it's constantly ongoing. So the fun part for me is I'm I'm learning from our product team all the time about what we're doing. And I go, well, who, a- who asked you to do that? <laughs> and, this, and, and the director of our product engineering, he just looked at me like, well, no one, we, we just heard that's a problem. We're going to go fix that. What a great mentality. What a great attitude to be a part of. Right. So that's a little bit about MindTickle. All right. Well, you guys can check it out at MindTickle.com. And I said, we're going to have another uh, conversation coming up. We'll talk more about that. But Pat, it was a pleasure. And I said, we'll have to have you back on the show soon. Thanks, Andy. It's an honor to be here. Thank right. you. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Pat. Again, that was Pat Lynch, VP of Sales Enablement, Excellence and Innovation at MindTickle. As mentioned before, Pat will be back on Accelerate in the next few weeks to talk more about sales readiness and sales enablement. Up next, it's time for another back and forth with my fantastic co-host, Bridget Gleason. Yeah, I'm still getting acclimated to the idea that I'm talking with her on Wednesday instead of Fridays because we did that Friday gig over 330 times, 130 times over the course of two and a half years. So today, Bridget and I are going to tackle the topic of how sales leaders should work with and coach their sales reps to help them move out of their comfort zones. You know, for sales reps to take their careers to the next level, whether that's working bigger deals or working with bigger customers or positioning themselves for promotion, it requires they take risks and proactively evolve how they sell. Now, this can be a difficult step for many to take and often requires coaching and support from a manager to make it happen. So what can you be doing as a sales leader to help your sellers move out of their comfort zones? Well, let's jump into it with Bridget. Bridget, how are you doing? Andy, Andy, Andy. I'm doing super wonderful. Oh, excellent. What about you? Where are you? I am in New York as I record this on the nice eastern edges of the zero time selling and accelerate empire. And um, yeah, just 
like you, enjoying the last blast of winter here. It's recording this in early April. We had snow already in April. It's like, geez <laughs> that Louise. We that we did. Oh, goodness gracious. Crazy, huh? Yeah, it melted almost instantly, though, so that was fine. But nonetheless, it served to get the weather forecasters all <laughs> bent on shape. They named, had another storm to name, because heaven forbid we get a weather system they don't name these days. I know. What is that about? I don't know. What's that trying about? To, trying not to hurt their feelings, I guess. I don't know. Storms can be sensitive. I must be. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I saw a great sales-related cartoon in the New Yorker. Actually, it was New Yorker Online, but um, yeah, and it was <laughs> two guys talking, and and one guy turns to the other, and the caption is, "That reminds me of the thing I was going to say next, regardless." <laughs> I thought, <laughs> perfect sales cartoon. That reminds me of the thing I was going to say next, regardless. Yes. Our overscripted, oh. overscripted sales reps. I love that. I don't care what you tell me. This is what I'm going to say to you back. So Exactly. Yeah, this is the answer. This is the answer, right. So actually, it sort of ties into the topic we're going to talk oh. about today, which was comfort zones, right? Part of the reason people do those things is, is they're trying to stay in their comfort zones. You know, don't, don't ask me something I don't know anything about or not prepared to talk about. And I thought, and there's been a lot written about it, and I had a a great talk with a guest recently on the show, uh, a professor from uh, Brandeis, I believe, uh, Andy Molinsky. Uh, we talked about uh, his new book on how to break out of your comfort zones, how to break your your comfort addictions. And I thought, well, yeah, that's a really interesting topic because we also talk about from the individual perspective. I just wondered, sort of perspective of sales managers is how do you help people break out of these comfort zones, right? When they get into this, this zone, they're just doing the things they feel comfortable with. They're not pushing themselves. They're not really doing what they need to do to get out there and, and either make calls or have the type of uh, hard discussions with, with prospects and customers to move deals forward. Yeah, I was going to I was just, as you were talking, I was thinking about, all right, with my own team, what are the comfort zones I guess it's easier for me to think about what are what are some common uh, sort of traps or like where do they get stuck? Where are common places that sales reps get stuck that we want them to to get out of that particular comfort zone? Or where do they hide? Or where do they hide? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Maybe they're not. Yeah, they're hiding in a certain place. That's in, that's a great way to. To, to think about it also. Yeah, you can you have these activity reports, and even in there, you can see where the reps are not, you know, just not putting themselves out there the way they need to. And, yeah, I remember working with one rep years and years ago that, you know, it's like the activity report was almost perfect, <laughs> but there was just that one thing. It's like, yeah, are you really making the calls or not? And, yeah, you really push came to shove. It really wasn't making the calls. I mean, he made a certain type of calls, but he wouldn't make the ones like the existing customers, but, and maybe the prospects he had met, but the things that were just completely cold. Oh, it was just the hardest time getting him to take that step forward. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's with a lot of, I think that's with a lot of reps. I think that's with a lot of reps that they, they have a, that's, that's a great example of where they get uh, stuck or hide as you put it. Yeah, and they can say, "Well, I took the, I talked to these existing customers. Maybe I got a, you know an upgrade or upsell from this order and from this customer. Excuse me, and you know, I'm dealing with these prospects, and it looks busy. I think this is one of the real challenges for sales managers is to sort of distinguish between what looks sort of busy versus that that really is real productive activity. And when you sort of have that, that's why I think people are sort of stuck in their comfort zones." And so then, the, then I guess back to your question, how do you help people get out of it? Well, that, I'm interviewing you today, if you, in case you hadn't noticed. I yeah, just, yeah. I just, I didn't intend it, but it just, just, but here we are. Just jumped out. Just jumped out. Yes. I can't help it. I'm bossy by nature. I think that's the subtitle of your book, isn't it? I'm bossy by nature. Yeah, yeah. That would be no surprise. There'd be no surprises. Anybody who knew me would be like, <laughs> yeah, we already knew that. I don't need to read the book. Well, for me, the, to answer your question, Miss Bossy Pants, is that 
what managers have to do is when you've identified these areas that people, their comfort zones are in, and you're trying to get them to move out, is too often what a manager will do is say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay out you know, what needs to happen here. And it's too big, right? That, so if you're trying to get people to step outside their comfort zone, they got to start with small steps, not big steps. And so you want to give people small successes that they can build on that you know, start luring them further and further. You know, the feeling of success starts luring them further and further out of their comfort zone. And so it's not say, oh, tell somebody to go make 50 calls. It's like, hey, and then get back to you and we'll see how you did. It's like, well, okay, tomorrow let's, let's pick two accounts on this list that you're going to call. Here's what, you know, how we're going to position the call. This is what you're going to say. And then let's come back and, and you know, we're either going to record the call and listen to it or you come back and report on it. And go small steps. And that's how people you know, acclimate themselves to getting outside their comfort zone as they can see bit by bit, yeah, well, this isn't so horrible. Yeah, I like that. I think um, if it's too big, it, there's just too much fear or resistance. or There's too much resistance, and maybe we don't even necessarily understand why, but there's going to be a lot of resistance. And so I, I like the idea of a small step that just gets repeated over and over and over and over and over. Mm-hmm. You know? And just keep repeating it. Keep repeating it till that becomes a new habit, till that becomes a new normal. Well, that becomes something that is familiar and you feel comfortable with. And then I think... Yeah, then you can go. And that, I, I think that's, for me, also a very natural way to move out of a, a, com- a comfort zone or a place where I'm stuck is pick one thing that I'm going to practice and just have my focus on that one thing that I'm going to get over. Once I get over that, then then I'm going to go to the next. Right. And I think that as a manager, what your job is, is when you've assigned these, these small steps, these tiny things someone's going to do, you have to praise them lavishly when they get them done. And you think, oh, you know, hey, <clears throat> we're all adults. We don't need to praise them, you know, like kids for doing some little thing. It's like, no, that's exactly what you're doing because this is a hard task somebody is doing. And you need to give them rewards for it. Similarly, if you're pushing yourself, you need to build in a series of rewards for doing what you're doing. What, what do you do you do that for yourself now, Andy, where you build rewards in for if you've got something hard to do? Do you say, OK, when I finish doing this, I'm going to go for a run or I'm going to go eat a pint of chocolate chip ice cream? <laughs> or Well, I'm not not doing that anymore. I'm on the my wife and I have embarked on the whole 30 eating plan. I'm familiar with that. <sighs> what is it? Just quickly, I know this is yeah, not it's, a, it's it. A, well, but sort of like but, the pa- sort of like the paleo. It's it's yeah. You know, no no additives, no sugar, no grains, no legumes, no good stuff, no dairy. What do you eat? What do you eat? <laughs> what do I eat? Vegetables. Oh, I don't. I don't hear. Okay, vegetables. Meat, good. meat and vegetables and salad. Meat, vegetables, and salad. Ad nauseum. Um. But it's you know supposed to be some of these things you know sort of like a a reset if you will for your body because you get out all the additives and the sugar and I don't know we'll see I mean, I think my wife's a bigger believer than I am but uh, I'm on the program though okay no alcohol either okay good but, yeah good easy for me to say yeah I was gonna say on a Friday night <laughs> okay so, so but anyway okay. what was your question so just well, yes I do you- reward myself. Yeah, could be going for a run, could be cool. hopping on the bike, going for a, a short bike ride. Um, in some cases, if it's you know just a matter of five minutes, because I like to uh, work and so those you know, twenty five minute sprints and then take five minutes off. Mm-hmm. Is Good. yeah, you know, go walk around the apartment for for five minutes or or uh, you know do do a set of ab work or something. That's so I hope that doesn't sound too compulsive, but um, it does but uh huh uh huh continue and continue. So yeah, just little things or yeah, give myself five minutes to go look at Twitter. Yeah. I, so this is also what I encourage, uh, reps managers to do when they're trying to incorporate a new behavior to, to get out of a comfort zone is to make sure just 
build in a reward for yourself after you do it. If I remember, Andy, when I was starting a company and I would cold call every day, Mm -hmm. every morning I'd cold call and I hated it. I hated it, but I knew I needed to do it and I did it, but I would always plan. I would do it the first thing and I would always plan something at the end of it just and it was it was often different different every day that I would say okay once I finish this then I'm going to like you said go for a run or I'm going to take 20 minutes I'm going to read for 20 minutes or like I would just have something that would just be the like the end point mm-hmm. as well as a just a little psychological reminder you know I I, I do the hard things and I do things I don't always like to do, but, and I, I give myself a pat on the back or just a good, glad you did it. Now let's keep going. So I think that's an important, I think that's important to include in there when you're encouraging people to learn to do something new. Yeah. So again, if you're a manager working with somebody you have that, again, seems a little stuck as you talked about a little too comfortable, maybe hiding from something mm. is yeah. Give them something small to break out of it that you can repeat, praise them, help them master that, and then they can take the next step to feel more comfortable maybe taking it on their own, uh, doing it personally, as you talked about, is, yeah, reward yourself. And I said, I love this idea of these Pomodoro timer, timers, excuse me, the little app you can have on your either your phone or your, your system that just says, counts down to 25 minutes, and then says take five, and you take five and come back and it starts over again. And it's a great way to sort of work in really concentrated bursts. And if you have that reward at the end, then say, okay, you know, in this 25 minute space, I'm going to make five calls. It's great. Yeah. I mean, another thing that was <laughs> interesting, a, a boss did to me at one point, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was stuck, I guess, is <laughs> he gave me the name of somebody. And I was like a CEO of a company that was in our territory. And he said, hey, could you call this person? I'm a little busy. Could you call this person for me? They had reached out to me and they're expecting my call. And I thought, okay, well, I can do that. That's easy. You know, that's, the stage is set and so on. They weren't. <laughs> wow. But, you know, it's funny that the CEO, like, got hold of He went along with it. I sort of said, you know, John said I should call you. He should be expecting my call. And <laughs> not at all. Um but I was really calm going into it. I was successful and and really broke that ice at that particular situation for me. So uh, <laughs> even a little deception works from time to time. Are you are you recommending that? Well, I think it can be used. Yeah, I, I think managers indulge in that all the time, don't you? Um, I mean, not not you know from a fraud. You mean not fraud? No, but things like I just sort of said is you know they sort of set people up to for challenges that. Uh, maybe hadn't been clearly explained. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think if I I probably do that, and I'm not as aware. You know, I'm not as aware of it. I I typically don't like it. I typically don't like it. I don't, I don't think it sets the right tone. I I get why people use it, but I think for me, I don't know. I just I I I can't think of a time that I intentionally did it. Maybe with my children. <laughs> but um, on the sales floor, I don't know that I've intentionally done. It's interesting, though. Going yeah. Out. Yeah. Well, I mean, gosh, I remember my first job out of school, you know, being sent on to call on prospects all the time with, there was always some ulterior motive <laughs> behind behind it. Uh, yeah. One time being sent to a customer, the managers knew that, that the customer was not happy. I had no idea. And, of course, I came back with an order, which was great. They weren't expecting that. That's always good. They weren't expecting that part. So I disarmed the customer by being a new fresh face. So, um, Mm. yeah. All right. So comfort zones, everybody has them. We all have them. You're going to break out of them. Start small, like everything, a new challenge. Break it down to small pieces. As Bridget said, repeat, 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 repeat. Master it, then take that next step. Simple. Sounds so simple. It does sound so simple. Doesn't it sound so simple? It does. All right. Well, Bridget. Andy. As always. Until next time.
until yeah. next time. Well, time. We'll, we'll talk to you next week. All right. Have a great week. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for this week. First of all, I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to thank my guest, Pat Lynch, and my partner in crime, Bridget Gleason. Join me again next week as I welcome Doug Sandler to Accelerate. I'm actually coming back for a second time. Doug is an author, speaker, podcaster, author of the interesting book titled Nice Guys Finish First, and host of the Nice Guys on Business podcast. And of course, as always, I'll be joined by Bridget for our weekly conversation, so be sure to join me then. Thanks again to our sponsor, Discover Org, for their ongoing support of Accelerate. And thank you again for joining me. Until next week, good selling, everyone. <laughs>